Hey everyone, this is Mark from Viperfish. Welcome to the first devlog for our new game, Underground. For now at least, Underground will be created entirely by me as a solo developer. I'll be starting from scratch in UT 2020. In our game, you'll manage an organization of assassins based in a disused London underground station. You'll send your agents out to gather key intelligence, locate valuable assets, and fulfill contract assignments. The foundation of Underground's gameplay will be built on some of the fundamentals of traditional turn-based roguelike games. My intention with these videos is to make a record of the game's development process in as much detail as possible. If you'd like to chat about this project or game development in general, then you're welcome to join our Discord server. You can find the link at the bottom right of the screen and it's also in the description below. So, to start off with, I create a new project from scratch using Unity 2020. In Unity Hub, I click on the New button and name the project Underground. I then select the 2D template since I'm not using any 3D assets and click Create. Unity then goes ahead and creates all the files needed for a brand new project. There's my new Underground folder containing the new project files, which includes a sample scene. In Unity's project tab, I'll rename this scene to Blueprint. I'm going to use this scene for the top-down turn-based map section of the game. I then create a project ID on my Unity account so that I can turn on Collaborate. Collaborate is Unity's built-in version control system, which I can use to save versions of the project to cloud storage as I go. This will allow me to restore individual files or the entire project to an earlier state if something were to go wrong. You can see the initial commit has automatically been saved for me. Since I'm here, I might as well create some of the folders I'll need going forward. The sprites folder will contain my image files. The scripts folder will be used for my c -sharp scripts. The palettes folder is for my tile palettes. And the tiles folder will keep my tiles organized. Since I want to use vector graphics in this game, I need to install Unity's vector graphics package. To do this, I have to add it to my project using a git URL. Because Unity has removed preview packages from its package manager list. With this installed, I'll be able to use SVG files as sprites. Now I go into the project settings, quality, and select the eight times multi-sampling anti-aliasing option to smooth the edges of my sprites. To make sure my camera uses those settings, I select it and change the MSAA option to use graphics settings. With that all set up, it's time to move on to the player and tile SVGs. This is my Photoshop mockup of the blueprint section of the game. In the center of the screen, you can see my icon for the player. This was made using shapes in Photoshop, which means it can be resized without losing any of its detail. In Unity, I've decided to go with a pixels per unit size of 128, which is the closest power of two number to the default pixels per unit size of 100. But because this player icon has a fair amount of detail, I've made it four times the size at 512 by 512 and exported it without the background as an SVG. I've then made a dark placeholder floor tile at 128 by 128 
using Photoshop's rectangle tool. And saved it as floor.svg. And finally, for the wall tile, I've made a light copy of this and saved it as wall.svg. I drop all three of those SVG files into my sprites folder in Unity and change the pixel per unit of each one to 128. The player is a little bit more complex than a square. So I decreased the distance of the sampling steps from 10 to 1 and increased the amount of sampling steps from 100 to 1000. So now when I drag the player sprite into the scene view, select the camera and decrease its size, you can see that the sprite keeps its edge detail even in an extreme close up. I want the player icon to fit inside of a unit. So I change its scale to 20%, which works out at about 102 by 102. This will allow for a bit of padding inside a 128 by 128 unit. It's now time to add a tile map to the project hierarchy and to create a tile palette, which will contain the floor and wall tiles. I go into my tile palette tab Select Create New Palette, name it Ground Tiles, and hit Create. I'll save it in the Palettes folder. And drag the Floor Sprite into my new palette, before saving it in a Ground Tiles folder inside my Tiles folder. I do the same with the wall sprite. My player icon is currently overlapping four grid lines. I'd like it to sit inside a tile unit. So I move the grid position up and to the right by 0.5 of a unit. This allows the player icon to fit inside of the grid lines. I then paint a very basic map of floor tiles on the tile map grid and surround it with wall tiles. After the graphics have been set up, it's time to turn my attention to some code using Visual Studio. The player needs to be able to move around and recognize the difference between floor and wall tiles. So I go into my scripts folder and create a C -sharp script called game tile. This class will allow me to store data for each individual tile, which will be very helpful as I add more functionality to the game in the future. I won't be needing the system classes in the script, so I'll remove them. And since I'm working with tile maps, I'll need to include the Unity Engine maps namespace. I don't want this particular class to inherit from Mono behavior. It's going to be a plain old class object. I also won't need Mono behavior's start or update functions. First, I want to create a local position property, which is a position relative to the parent grid object of our tile map. This can be a vector three int as it doesn't require floating point precision. I then create a world position property. This is the position of the tile relative to the root of the scene. Tile base will give me the base class for the tile, allowing me to access tile specific data like whether it's a floor or wall tile.
tile map member gives me an easy way to figure out which tile map the tile belongs to. And tile name is simply a string containing the local X and Y position of the tile, mainly for debugging purposes. Now I'll create a tile manager script. This will manage and provide access to a dictionary of all the tiles on the map. I'll include the Unity Engine.tilemaps namespace as before. And since I want this to be a singleton, easily accessible from my other scripts, I'll create an instance variable of this tile manager class. I then create a reference to the tile map object. And finally, a dictionary called tiles to hold the game tile objects. We don't need the update function and I'll change the start function to use monobehavior's awake function instead, which is called after all scene objects are initialized. I set the instance variable to this instance of this mono behavior and call a function I'm about to write called getGameTiles. So now for the getGameTiles function. I'll set the tiles variable to create a new dictionary object ready for our tiles. Now I loop through each position in the tile map, getting a vector 3 int back as pos. I save each position as a local variable. And check if there's a tile at that position within the tile map. If there is a tile in that position, I instantiate a new game tile object as tile and store all the data as outlined in the game tile class. Finally, I add this new game tile object into the tiles dictionary. At this point, I should have a dictionary of all the tiles in the tile map. So I'll drag the tile manager script onto the grid object in the project hierarchy and drag the tile map object from the hierarchy to the script reference variable. Now it's time to create the player script, which will manage user input and player movement. I'll add the Unity Engine.tilemaps namespace again. I'll make a float value for the speed of the player movement. A vector 3 for the target position I want the player to move to and a boolean value to check whether the player is currently moving. I won't be using the start function as I don't need to initialize anything at this stage. Inside my update function, which gets called once per frame, I create two floats to record the horizontal and vertical user input. I'm using getAccessRaw to return a value without Unity's smoothing filter applied, 
I don't want the values to ramp up over time. I want the final input value instantly. When using game controller thumbsticks, it's common to get float values in between 0 and 1. So I'm also using system.math.sign to round the input value up or down to 1 or minus 1. If the player isn't currently moving, I check to see whether we're getting any horizontal or vertical input. I'm using mathf.abs to convert any input to a positive value, so I can just check if it's greater than zero. If we have user input, then I set the target position to the current transform position, plus the input value. Now that I have a target position, I need to check to make sure there isn't a wall tile there before I can move the player. So I'll create a target tile position variable to record the target position minus the 0.5 adjustment made to the tile map grid. I'll grab the dictionary of tiles from the tile manager instance, saving it to a local variable and create a game tile variable called tile ready to store any valid tile we find at the target position. Then I check to see if there's a tile in the dictionary at the target tile position. And if there is, I check to make sure it's not a wall tile before starting a move coroutine function, which I'll write in a moment. Okay, the move coroutine is going to set is moving to true so that it can't be triggered again whilst the player is in the process of moving towards the target position. While the distance of the player is greater than 0.01 from the target position, I gradually move the player towards the target position at the speed defined by the public variable speed. Speed is multiplied by time.delta time, which is the time that's passed since the last frame. This ensures the player moves at a constant speed smoothing the animation between the two positions. Yield return null makes sure the while loop waits till the next frame to run again. Without this, the while loop would simply run all its iterations within the same frame. When the while loop is finished, I move the player to the exact target position and set is moving to false, allowing user input to affect player movement again. Then I'll drag the player script onto the player object, set the speed variable to 5, and hit play to test my work. And there we go, it works, moving the player tile by tile. When I try to move onto a wall tile, it's not letting me, which is perfect. So that's a start. I've got some basic movement of the player moving tile by tile and a mechanism to identify the different tiles. Obviously the graphics in the project are currently just placeholders to enable some basic development of the gameplay systems. It's an understatement to say that there's a lot more to do. So I'll be continuing my work on the game in the next video. Thanks for watching. See you next time.